Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Finance Committee public hearing. Um, thank you to the directors and staff and residents who are here today. Um, the purpose of today's finance hearing is to review the 2020 proposed operating budget for the City of Columbus. The mayor submitted this budget for consideration last week, one week ago on November 13th. And I know that um, so many folks in this room worked very hard to, um, to get the budget to um, this stage of proposal to Columbus City Council. So I appreciate all the directors for this work uh, and your staffs. We tabled the budget yesterday, or excuse me, two days ago at Monday's council meeting as we review it through our hearing process. Today's hearing will provide a broad overview of city revenue, a review of the budget process and overall budget from Director Lombardi, and a brief summary of individual budgets from each department. Additional hearings will be held in the coming weeks through our committee chairs to provide a more detailed look at department budgets. The schedule for these hearings has been published in the City Journal and shared by our communications team. There will be an opportunity to provide pu public testimony today and at each of the other hearings on the schedule. Residents who are not able to attend any individual hearing can call or email my office or other council offices to provide feedback, ask questions. Through this process, we want to highlight how the operating budget supports the success of every resident and family in Columbus, while also we want to gather feedback on how the city can continue to improve the services it provides. As a council, we have worked collaboratively to put forward our priorities for this budget. Strong neighborhoods, good paying jobs, pathways out of poverty, and effective governing. We look forward to working with Mayor Ginther and each department as we align our shared priorities through this budget and continue moving our city forward. I want to offer a special thanks to Director Lombardi and his um, team for spearheading this process, as well as to each director and department representative here today. It takes a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes over weeks and months before this review begins. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you again for being here and for your ongoing work. I want to highlight that public testimony will be after presentations. Um, you may fill out a speaker slip and you will have three minutes uh, per uh, resident. I would now like to begin the hearing formally by turning it over to Auditor Kilgore to provide an overview of city revenue as we start working through today's agenda. Thank you, Auditor Kilgore, for joining us. Finance Chair Brown, I would not miss it. Um, and forgive me for kind of rushing in here. Um, I have the, the privilege of maybe offering some comments about how the year of 2019 is ending and certainly a little bit about 2020. And um, Chair Brown, if you want me to hit on anything, you know, please, please, uh, please ask. Overall, income tax continues to be our material source of revenues. This year, we're ending the year with income tax being about 78% of the city's total revenues. 2019, we began the year a bit slower. We're definitely ending the year a bit stronger in income tax. The reason for that is largely because business profits are back up. We are seeing some investment in new lines of business across the local economy. We're also seeing you know, some of the wages that were previously a bit stagnant last year. We're seeing some additional increases in those wages. But really what moved the needle for us was business profits being uh, you know, largely increased versus what our early projections were based upon this time last year. With respect to other sources of revenue, all of which are about 5% or less, um, income tax being almost 80% of our total revenues, everything else, not that it's not important, but it's not very material. And so as an example, property taxes came in just about where we expected. Investment earnings though, thanks to the good work of council, the Department of Finance and Management, last year in 2018, we outsourced our investment management. We went out and we did bids. We found national companies who do this for, you know, frankly 24 seven, 365 days a year. And as you all know, we have about a billion eight in an investment portfolio. All of the city's funds are pulled together and we invest that. That investment proved very worthwhile and it was a lift for council 
and the Finance and Management Department to try and, uh, with our office and the Treasurer's Office, get that moving last year, but it definitely has paid off. Um, additional funds came in very, very strong through 2019, and we expect that to remain into 2020 as well. Um, with respect to the other sources of revenue, all being about 5% or less, as I mentioned, everything is on track and as expected. Um, so with respect to uh, 2020, total estimated available resources, which of course is what drives the, the budget document, is about $965 million. And again, that material source of revenue, income tax, our projection for income tax in 2020 is 3%, which is um, a, a, sizable, uh, a sizable chunk of change. Um, so happy to answer uh, any questions. We remain you know, pretty much um, working in lockstep with Department of Finance and Management. With respect to the auditor's um, revenue estimate, we do try and update this about monthly, so if any of you have questions about how we're doing, we are uh, certainly always happy to uh, answer those questions. Great. Thank you, Auditor Kilgore. Um, I'm sorry, I'm eating a cake that Angie Blevins made, and it's really, really good. So you call me mid-bite. <laughs> Angie Blevins is an amazing baker. Um, Auditor Kilgore, would you mind, before we turn to uh, department heads for testimony, to um, just bring anyone who's viewing up to speed on the, um, the changes that the state made, which affected sort of the position we thought we were in a year ago, basically, when it comes to um, revenue and the um, increase that came in at the start of last year, which kind of makes our numbers look a little different. Sure, and there was a, for those of you who maybe know a little bit, the state of Ohio made some efforts to um, have something called centralized collection, wherein certain businesses were able to opt in and pay their taxes. Let's say they had a, um, a business in four different counties. They were able to, instead of making tax payments to each of those four counties, they could make it to one single entity, the state of Ohio, and that would be dispersed down. When the state created this program, which um, we are still very much in opposition to, because frankly that takes away from our ability if we levy the tax to also collect it, and it's so important to work with the constituents if they have tax issues. Right now we, we can't help them very, very well. Um, but what happened was the state of Ohio also changed some of the due dates on when those taxes are due. And so the tax that was previously due to us on 1231 was bumped to the next year on January 1. Truthfully though, the impacts of the state's changes was not the material impact to income tax in terms of you know, what it, how it affected us from a financial standpoint, but it was a component. And this is our first year, I will call, of new normal with those dates in place. So we did have some adjustment. What was the, the larger, more underlying current throughout the year, um, and especially in 2018, which we had a very tough, tight year in terms of income tax, was, uh, you know, frankly, fear. I talked to a lot of companies. Um, we look at, just so you know, our, our barometer is about the top 100 largest taxpayers. We look at how they're performing. Are they adding employees? Are they doing layoffs? Are there significant retirements? You know, we try and keep an eye on things that way. In 2018, the folks were, were around here quite um, nervous about the national economy and the state of the economy. So we did not see many new lines of business being set up or significant new increases in jobs. We really saw more mergers and acquisitions. In 19, and especially as the year is going on, we have seen that rebound some. But again, the more sizable benefit to us has been um, corporate profits have back up. And, um, you know, frankly, uh, things that we can control, like the investment earnings and making sure that we're optimizing those revenue streams have been very successful for us as well. Great. Thank you, Auditor. Um, we will move into department testimony. Uh, we will start with the Finance and Management Department, Director Joe Lombardi. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, on behalf of the administration, I am pleased to present uh, Mayor Ginther's proposed 2020 operating budget. Uh, before we go through that, I do have a few thank yous. I want to thank Mayor Ginther for his leadership and the mayor's office staff, uh, your leadership as chairperson of the Finance Committee and all the city council members and their staffs, uh, Auditor Kilgore and her staff, all my department colleagues, 
and especially my finance staff who uh, really do the brunt of all the work and uh, up to the last minute are crunching final numbers and uh, couldn't be here today uh, talking proudly about this budget without them. So I want to make sure they get their shout out. Uh, this, this is a real brief uh, overview of how the budget process works. Typically in May, the finance department will establish target numbers for each department. We, we send those targets out to them. Uh, they uh, will then ask for some target adjustments uh, during the months of June. And a little bit of July, the, the finance department will review those adjustments and uh, make final uh, decisions on um, how those adjustments will fit into the target uh, budget. Then we uh, do meet with uh, all the department heads um, usually that's in September, August time period. Um, we go through their budget and ensure that uh, the priorities of the mayors are in, in council are, are included in their budgets. And then in October, uh, typically we'll get at the first part of October, uh, Auditor Kilgore will provide us with her official estimate for the income tax growth for the following fiscal year. We'll uh, have meetings with the mayor's office to uh, provide final uh, guidance, and then obviously we will also talk with all the council members and brief them on the council on the uh, budget, uh, which is due by charter by the mayor on November 15th of every year. The proposed budget submitted to city council for consideration is balanced, fiscally responsible, and provides funding for Mayor Ginther's priorities of neighborhoods, safety and public health, economic development and affordable housing, birth to five and education, diversity and inclusion, and innovation and sustainability. This afternoon, I'll provide an overview of the general fund budget and then speak uh, briefly about the Department of Finance and Management's proposed 2020 operating budget. Each department representative here this afternoon will have an opportunity to provide details of his or her respective budgets as well. The 2020 operating budget was built on a combination of resources. The city auditor has estimated income tax growth for 2019 to be 4.5%, which is an increase over her original estimate of 2.25. Furthermore, the city auditor, as she indicated, official estimate for income tax growth for 2020 is 3%. The revised revenue estimate did provide an additional $20 million of resources. Other resources that went into building this budget include $12 million in savings and $9 million in cancellations of encumbrances. Though the economy in Columbus continues to show stable growth, the administration also prepared for the future by making deposits into the rainy day fund and the basic city services funds to ensure that the city is in position for an eco any economic changes or revenue deduction reductions. The total 2020 operating budget equals $1.96 billion when all funds are considered. The general fund portion of the budget is $965 million. The general fund supports approximately 5,400 employees and provides for basic city services that are necessary to provide core services to our community. The general fund budget for 2020 is 5.6% higher than in 2019's amended budget in part due to an increase in the Department of Finance and Management citywide account, which I will discuss later. The Department of Safety continues to be the largest of the general fund agencies, representing 67% of the budget. Our safety forces are the best in the country, and to support the men and women that keep our neighborhoods safe, Mayor Ginther has proposed a general fund budget that totals $647.4 million. That budget includes funding for 90 police recruits, 70 fire recruits, new classes in the police and fire cadet program, and the components of the mayor's comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy, which includes the care coalition, safe street initiatives, violent crime review group, shot spotter, and intervention programs to reduce gun violence through the Department of Health and Recreation and Parks. The budget further provides funding for the implementation of the matrix recommendations for the division of police. Columbus, like many other communities throughout the United States, has been affected by the opioid epidemic. This national crisis requires collaboration on many fronts within the community. The city is a partner in the Franklin County Opiate Action Plan, and the administration's 2020 proposed budget continues to address this crisis 
with funding over $1.9 million for treatment and prevention options, Narcan supplies, and other proactive educational programs. Our diverse neighborhoods are the soul of Columbus, and the mayor continues to invest in them. The 2020 budget includes funding for the implementation of the One Linden Plan, Hilltop Rising, My Brother's Keeper, New Americans Leadership Academy, Neighborhood Pride Programming, in support of our area commissions. Furthermore, monies are allocated within the Department of Development for pro, another proactive code enforcement team, also known as PACE. Many in our community are still in need of our support, and the mayor is committed to help those residents who rely on vital community services to meet their basic needs. To that end, the city will continue to support our service partners and provide funding for the Community Shelter Board, Primary One Health, and other vital human social services. In Franklin County, approximately 150 babies die each year, and every child deserves to thrive in our community. Through the work of Celebrate One, efforts continue to reduce infant mortality. However, there is still more work to be done. That is why the 2020 budget provides $1.75 million in funding for Celebrate One to enhance its mission. The 2020 budget includes funding in the Department of Health for women's health and wellness services, pre- and postnatal care, and evidence-based home visiting programs. Mayor Ginther believes in ensuring a bright future for all of our children in Columbus. Children who attend high-quality early education are more likely to succeed in kindergarten and in life. The general fund budget will provide funding for the Early Start program and Future Ready, which will help support high-quality pre-K opportunities with star-rated service providers. Funding is also included in recreation parks to expand the Center Without Walls program to offer after-school program programming and recreational opportunities to children on the southeast side. The administration is committed to more diverse and inclusive workforce and supplier base. The budget includes dollars to support the Columbus Women's Commission, whose mission is to advance the economic well-being of women. The budget also provides funding to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion to implement the recommendations of the disparity study, support staffing, training, and outreach strategies. As the auditor indicated, income tax represents 78% of revenue stream and small businesses make up 80% of our business community. Therefore, Columbus must remain attractive for job growth and economic development. The proposed 2020 budget includes funding within the Department of Development for organizations such as Rev1 Ventures and One Columbus to encourage entrepreneurship, innovation, and small business development. As indicated earlier, although 2019 is outperforming initial estimates for income tax, Mayor Ginther has proposed to set aside resources to provide essential city services and plan and prepare for any sudden and long-term economic challenges. The city has kept its promise to voters to increase the rainy day fund, and I am proud to say that with an additional $1 million deposit in 2019, the city has met its goal of $80 million a year early with a projected balance of $80.6 million. The 2020 budget includes a deposit of $2.5 million, and the balance in the rainy day fund after that deposit at the end of 2020 is estimated to be $84.6 million. The mayor recently announced a new goal of the rainy day fund to $90 million by the end of the year 2024. The 2020 budget includes a deposit of $5.6 million into the Basic City Services Fund with a projected balance at the end of 2020 of $20.4 million to withstand sudden, short-term fiscal challenges. In addition, a deposit of $2.6 million will be made to the 27th pay period. This fund was established in anticipation of a 27th pay, which will occur in 2020. The City of Columbus is a vibrant and diverse community, and Mayor Ginther believes all neighborhoods should share in that success. As the 14th largest city in the country, the City of Columbus continues to be one of five cities our size to maintain a AAA bond rating from all three major rating agencies. While our community has experienced unprecedented growth, there are challenges that still need to be addressed. The administration believes that sound fiscal policies will enable us to prepare for the future and address the needs of the community. 
Together, we can ensure Columbus will be in a position to continue providing high quality services to our residents, provide success and opportunities to our neighborhoods, and to be America's opportunity city. In closing, I would like to thank Mayor Ginther for his leadership, Council Member Brown for your leadership as Finance Committee Chair, all the council members and their staff, Auditor Kilgore and her staff, my department colleagues, and especially my team for all their dedication and hard work. That concludes my overview of Mayor Ginther's 2020 operating budget, and I will answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Director Lombardi. I do have just one um, question that uh, it goes without saying the rainy day fund is important important, right? We all kind of understand the basic importance of, of saving and preparing for the future. Um, and I appreciate the efforts of the department and the mayor and uh, council's vote two nights ago to get us to our 80 million goal early. And I'm glad that we set a new goal. I, I want to ask, um, this, this relates to Auditor Kilgore too, or it might be better suited for Auditor, Auditor, Auditor Kilgore. Is our rainy day fund and the, the um, the, the room that's created there for saving, is that connected to our credit rating in any way? Is it something the agencies look for and um, appreciate? Uh, yeah, absolutely. The short answer is, um, you know, with respect to the rating agencies, they have certain criteria based upon percentages of operating expenditures in any given year. And so we have, um, frankly, very robust reserves in the utilities and um, Director Davies and I spent a great deal of time with uh, actually Assistant Director Lee working on um, those right reserve levels for the utilities and the Department of Finance and Management. Um, but with respect to the Rainy Day Fund, you know, approximately about 10% is the goal of operating expenditures for good savings. Um, we do not have a crystal ball to say exactly when this next recession is going to hit. You know, all of us in this room, uh, a lot of us in this room, Remember the tough times of 07 and 08, and even 02 and 01, 03. Um, the fact is, is that Columbus's economy being as, as professional services driven as it is, we kind of go into recession slow and we exit slowly. We do not have the ups and downs of, let's say, a Detroit or even a Youngstown. Instead, we have more kind of undulating waves. And this rainy day fund commitment is right in line that will get us closer if our you know, budget's 965 million ish, then it'll get close to, to that. Great, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Director Lombardi, for your overview. Uh, we will move into additional department presentations now. Um, uh, Assistant Director of the Department of Public Safety, Bob Stewart, thank you for being here and outlining you're the winner. The D Public Safety Department gets $647 million. Um, so <laughs> thanks for uh, taking the time. We're reminded of that quite often, actually. <laughs> right. <laughs> Council President Pro Tem Elizabeth Brown, uh, good afternoon and thank you. I'm pleased to present with you a, or present to you a brief synopsis of the proposed public safety budget for 2020. Public safety manages the operations of the divisions of police, fire, sports services, and the safety director's office. We're very appreciative of the budget allocation for public safety as it continues to be Mayor Ginther's top priority as shown by the allocation of the 67% of the general fund budget. The 2020 public safety budget totals approximately 647.4 million. This budget represents 3.42% increase over the 2019 public safety budget proposed expenditures. The budget allocates approximately 360 million for police, 271.4 million for fire, 7.9 million for support services, and 8.1 million for safety administration. With these funds, the division will continue to provide public safety services for the internationally accredited divisions of police and fire. Some of the major public safety initiatives to, for 2020 are the police classes. The proposed budget for 70 police recruits, 35 in June and 35 in December of 2020, continues the mayor's trend to in, either increase or maintain the total number of firefighters over projected retirements. For a number of years, we were only budgeted funding for single uh, fire classes. Examples, 2012-35 recruits, 
2013 35, 2014 40, 2015 45. However, Mayor Ginther added an additional class to the total of 65 in 2016 and also unbudgeted two classes totaling 80 recruits in 2017, 85 in 2018, and 75 in 2019. The 2019 year ending year end projected number of uh, 1,660 firefighters will help us in the staffing for the new fire station number 35. For police, police recruits it anticipated <clears throat> that uh, uh, during 2020 there will be a total of 90 separations. Officers lost during these separations will be replaced with two budgeted classes totaling 90 recruits, 45 in June and 45 in December to maintain our nationally accredited division of police uh, and also maintain sworn levels at the highest ever. The Narcan exp expansion, the division of police will continue with the program started in 2017 with 150,000 to equip many new additional officers with this life-saving drug to counter heroin overdose. In addition, the city of Columbus recently received a four-year award of 1.9 million from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to support the city's our REACT team activities. As part of the Comprehensive neighbor safe, Neighborhood Safety Program, police budget <clears throat> includes, the police budget includes 2.9 million for additional overtime, replacement bicycles, and equipment to support the Safe Streets Initiative. This initiative will undoubtedly foster safety and enhance police community relations. The budget includes funding for a second class of 20 cadets each for police and fire to continue building the pipeline of qualified diverse candidates to each of the safety force academies uh, for the two divisions. The initial cadet classes, uh, which began in 2019, were fully funded for, uh, in 2020, for 2020. A total of 625,000 in addition uh, in the 2020 budget uh, fund for shot spotter, which was strategically, de uh, strategically deployed across nine square miles of the city during the first quarter of 2019 and has proven to be an effective tool in identifying and reducing response times to gunfire. As it relates to vehicles, public safety will work with fleet safety uh, division to determine the number of cruisers, unmarked vehicles, and other general fund light vehicles uh, to be replaced in 2020. In 2019, the Public Safety Department purchased 50 marked police first responder SUVs and six marked fire SUVs. In addition, we purchased 18 unmarked administrative electric vehicles for police and fire and three special duty SUVs for the police department. As it relates to programs and initiatives, the following programs are funded at or slightly less than last year. The jail contract is $4.3 million. The EMS billing contract, $2.3 million. Community Crime Patrol, 375000 Columbus San Humane Society, 225000 And the Crime Stoppers, 33000 Police Community Relations. We will continue to engage the community to foster a partnership of mutual trust and greater understanding. I'd like to thank you for your time and your support. We are available to respond to any questions or concerns you may have about the public safety budget. And in closing, public safety appreciates the generous support of Mayor Ginther and the Columbus community and city council. Thank, thank you, you so much, Assistant Director Stewart. Um, we do have a, a speaker slip um, from, I'm going to go a little out of order, um, not what I promised at the beginning, I apologize, but we have um, some friends and colleagues here from uh, Firefighters Local 67, um, and Vice President Stephen Stein filled out a, a speaker slip. I see you have um, Vice President Sweetman and President Seamer with you as well, who are welcome to come to the podium, but otherwise, you may join us. Yeah. 
vice president of uh, Columbus Firefighters Union Local 67. I'm responsible to represent the over 1,500 men and women of CFD who keep our citizens safe uh, day in and day out. Uh, as you are well aware, demand for fire and emergency medical services are at an all time high as our city continues to enjoy near over year to year Nearly 160,000 times last year, Columbus firefighters provided exceptional care and compassion to our citizens. However, in that same time period, there were almost 40,000 times when our citizens in their most vulnerable moments had to rely on township agencies to meet their emergency needs. Uh, as fast as our city has added people, businesses, and buildings, we are losing firefighters through attrition at an exceptional rate. But we are concerned that the hiring proposals and the early drafts of the 2020 operating budget will barely fulfill all the public attrition rates as we lose our men and women to retirement through service injuries, job-related cancers, and the grim reality of firefighter suicide. We know the citizens of Columbus have always had our backs, and we know we can count on our elected leader and council to support us with the people and resources we so desperately need. Again, thank you for this forum and the opportunity for us to engage in this dialogue with you. We appreciate your Columbus Council's leadership, as well as uh, the rest of that is in Columbus Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice President Stein. Congratulations on your wedding, too. Um, uh, Assistant Director Stewart, um, could you uh, go, go into a more detail on the staffing proposal for our firefighters? I know that Vice President Stein highlighted the relationship between um, our public safety department and township uh, firefighters, and um, if you could if you could speak to that relationship. And I also want to note that we will have I'm looking for the date here. We will have a specific um, public safety. Uh, hearing where all these things will be discussed in even greater detail, but assistant director Certainly um, what I'd like to do is, is perhaps check with uh, my other office mate on the specifics on the staffing levels for for fire uh, What I have is what I was presented uh, uh, for me for this Good afternoon, President Pro Tem. Hi. My name is Echo Dennis, Assistant Director for Public Safety. Uh, for 2020, fire is budgeted a class of 35 and 35, of two classes of 35 recruits. The assumption this year was that fire was going to, when we presented our budget to finance, the assumption was that fire was going to lose 70 officers. Uh, finance adjusted it because they had more clear picture of what their uh, retirements would be. So instead of 70, the assumption was they will lose 60 in 2019, which means they were gaining 10 from the budget of 35 and 40. So from, I have a, a graph of the growth, they are supposed to end next year with a class of 35 and 35. They are supposed to end the year with 1606 firefighters, which will be the highest number. If that happens, the highest number they've been for over 10 years. Do you know what staffing, like, and you may not know the answer to this, which I understand. This is the start of a conversation, obviously. We've got more budget hearings to come, but do you know what it would take staffing level wise? Um, to reduce that uh, 40,000, the 40,000 runs that township uh, fire departments took? Uh, not exactly. Um, I think the fire chief has mentioned that he needs a total of, not recruits, but a total of probably 15, 55 fighters on board at one time to be able to uh, fulfill the, the commitments of the fire department. 1550? I believe that number. I'll check that number and make sure it's, okay. uh, it's, it's mentioned that. But they'll end the year, this year, with 1606, and that includes recruits. That would include a recruit that will be hired in December of this year of 40. I will, I will follow up um, with my colleague, uh, Council Member Mitch Brown, who chairs public safety, and with you all at the department to continue to understand these numbers and how it's reflected in our recruits. 
Thank you for your testimony, um, Vice President Stein. I appreciate you, you taking the time to be here today. And thank you for, for pinch hitting um, for Assistant Director Stewart, too. Um, we will have a um, public safety focused hearing, hearing of the Public Safety and the Veterans Affairs Committees um, will be Wednesday, to, uh, December 11th at 4 p.m. Um, so we look forward to uh, a conversation on this at that time as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other public comment um, in regards to the Department of Public Safety, I would like to move to the Department of Public Service. Assistant Director Steve Wenzel. Thank you, President Pro Tem Brown. Thank you for this opportunity to present the highlights of the Department of Public Services proposed 2020 operating budget. The Department of Public Services is comprised of the Director's Office and five divisions. So we have the Refuse Collection Division, Parking Services Division, Infrastructure Management, Traffic Management, and Design and Construction. In 2020, we have a proposed funding level of $138.2 million for the Department of Public Service, which represents a 16.3% increase over the 2019 operating budget. Most of this increase, or about $15 million, is attributed to the city receiving additional gas tax funds associated with Ohio House Bill 62 that passed earlier this year. I will detail out the major uses of those funds later in my presentation. So this budget for 2020 will fund 848 full and part-time personnel that provide some of the most core city services, including refuse collection, which contains residential bulk and recycling, maintaining and improving our roadways, which is fixing potholes, plowing snow, installation and maintenance of traffic signals, signage, pavement markings to promote safety of our citizens, publicly managed parking, and making Columbus a safer city for pedestrians and bicyclists. The proposed 2020 budget for the director's office is 17.2 million, which represents about 5.2% of our overall proposed budget. The director's office provides the overall coordination policy direction for the department, as well as a consolidated fiscal and human resource functions. In 2020, for the Division of Refuse Collection, we have proposed funding of $37.1 million. This represents a minor increase of 0.46% over the 2019 operating budget. This proposed funding will support 226 full-time personnel that provide trash collection services to more than 340,000 households every week, 52 weeks a year. Of that 226 full-time personnel, 20 will be dedicated, which is up from 12 last year, to support the Clean Neighborhoods Initiative to address the persistent problem of illegal dumping in our neighborhoods, with a total budget allocation of about $1.8 million. The 2020 proposed budget for parking services is approximately $8.2 million, all supported by parking meter revenues. The Division of Parking Services is responsible for administration, enforcement, operations, and management of public parking in the City of Columbus. The Division also sets policy and manages parking access programs. The Division includes the Business Office, Parking Enforcement, Meter Operations, as well as Policy and Strategy Section. In 2020, the Parking Meter Program Fund and the Parking Services Division will also include the creation of the Downtown Parking Benefit District, a sub-fund which, which excess parking meter revenue from within the Downtown District will be reinvested back into the Downtown District to fund transportation and mobility initiatives to, to support the strategic parking plan. Of course, this is all after the division recovers its operating costs. The Division of Infrastructure Management's 2020 total budget request is approximately $40 million. This represents an increase of about 19%, all within the Street Construction Maintenance and Repair Fund. The division provides street maintenance services within the City of Columbus rights of way, including street sweeping, litter control, graffiti removal, snow and ice removal, all in an efficient manner. As I mentioned earlier, the increase in the street fund is mainly due to the increase in gas tax revenues, um, the additional funds next year will help the division address a backlog of 311 right-of-way requests for infrastructure items. 
we will be hiring an additional 34 staff members to increase existing services for street repair and maintenance. This will include such things as pothole patching, general pavement repair for roadways and alleys, mowing, street sweeping, sidewalk gap construction, snow and ice control, roadside trash pickup, and graffiti removal. The Division of Traffic Management is making our streets safer for motorists, pedestrians, and bicyclists. The Division's 2020 total proposed budget is $21.7 million. This represents approximately a $7 million increase over the 2019 budget, again, a most, mostly associated with additional gas tax revenue. The Division of Traffic Management is responsible for planning, educating, and advocating for greater mobility of various roadway users to ensure a safe and efficient transportation system for pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicular traffic. Included in the $7 million increase is seven expansion positions and contracts to convert 63 pre-timed intersections to activated intersections. It'll install battery backups to signals that cross arterial roadways and railroad crossings. Um, it's going to update some of our traffic signal timing, which hasn't been done in about 20 years. It'll also allow us to rebuild and or refurbish signals at various intersections. The Division of Design and Construction's 2020 total proposed budget is $23.9 million, which is roughly about an 18% increase. The Division of Design and Construction is responsible for developing quality construction plans, managing design contracts, and enabling the department to build and maintain a safe and efficient transportation system. In addition, the division manages construction contracts, providing quality, timely, and construction inspection ser surveying and materials testing services to support public service, public utilities, and privately funded infrastructure improvement projects. This budget includes expanded funding for 10 additional full-time inspector positions needed to meet the demand of our rapidly growing and developing city. Other expanded programs included the, the addition of $1 million to design and construct ADA-compliant curb ramps throughout the city. That concludes my presentation of the 2020 Department of Public Service proposed operating budget. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Um, and just for a point of clarification and to make sure I'm thinking about it correctly, the, the budgets for many of the core public service programs are about staffing levels to get the work done. Um, but the capital budget is what really you know, gives you the ability to buy the concrete for the sidewalk work and, and, and do that side of, of the work. So you've got to have both and, right? You've got to have sufficient levels in capital and in operating to do the really good service that you just outlined. Yeah, that is correct, uh, President Pro Tem Brown. Um, it, it is a, a definitely a balancing act. Um, we do a lot of these core services in the infrastructure within the right of way with internal staff, um, which is, you know, of course, needed on the operating side of roughly about somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of our operating budget is staffing. Um, and then on the capital side is also where we buy some of our commodities as far as, as concrete and, and doing the construction projects and design of the, the, the more detailed type of projects that we have within our department. And hiring a contractor to do the design of um, a, a street repaving or to do the actual repaving itself can all fall under capital or a portion of that falls under um, operating? So well, in, in that specific instance, um, council member, uh, for repaving, for resurfacing, yeah. all the design work is done in-house. So we do that with, within our operating budget. We do keep track of um, all of our time and bill back to the capital project, so we recuperate those costs within our operating fund also. But it, most of the construction is all done out of our capital budget. So um, that's where we get a lot of our projects and a lot of things that you'll see being constructed in the street uh, through our capital program. Thank you so much for your time today, um, Assistant Director. Next, we have Assistant Director of the Department of Public Utilities, Mr. John Lee. Good afternoon, President Pro Tem Brown. Thank you for allowing me to present the Department of Public Utilities 2020 operating budget. The Department's 2020 budget totals $670 million. $385 million of those dollars supports our operating and maintenance expenses and $285 million supports our debt service. Our total budget covers five divisions. We have our director's office, a Division of Stormwater, Division of Water, Division of Sewers and Drains, and finally our Division of Power. 
Overall, our 2020 budget is largely a continuation budget, and I'll highlight some areas where we are increasing some personnel with the goal of improving services to meet the growing demand of our utility services. <clears throat> In our director's office, the total budget is increasing 6% above 2019 levels for a total budget of 34 million. <clears throat> One of the largest increases for 2020 is personnel. Uh, the budget includes funding for an additional 10 new full-time positions in our customer service call center and one information systems technician. One of our strategic priorities for 2020 is to improve our customer service by better management of call volumes in the center, uh, minimizing customer hold times, and responding timely to customer billing questions. We believe that adding these additional personnel will help improve these service levels overall. For our division of stormwater, that division provides effective stormwater collection services to the community within the corporate limits of Columbus. Overall, the stormwater budget totals 4.19 million. It's actually lower than the 2019 budget by a little bit. The decrease is largely due to a 3.6% de uh, decrease in debt service costs for 2020, uh, and operating and maintenance costs are increasing about 1.3% compared to 2019 levels. We are requesting one additional employee for our stormwater permit compliance program in 2020. This additional personnel will allow us to maintain our commitment to EPA to increase our compliance prevention of harmful pollutants from being washed into stormwater sewers and local rivers. Our Division of Water's total budget is $202 million and is 6% above the 2019 budget. Operations and maintenance expenses are increasing 3% while debt service expenses are increasing 9.6%. Debt service expenses cover the annual principal and interest payments used for bonded debt and loan payments for our capital improvement program. The budget supports a total of 450 full-time positions, which includes the addition of six new positions. During our recent water plant upgrades at all three of our plants, we had a need for more maintenance mechanics with all the equipment that was installed uh, as well as additional operators at those plants. In 2020, we also plan to begin implementation of our enhanced metering program, uh, where we're replacing water meters with advanced meters out in the community with remote read technology and better data tracking technology for customers. Our Division of Sewers and Drainage budget is $297 million and is 6% higher than 2019 budget. Operations expenses increased about 5.9%, while debt services increasing 6.4%. Some operating costs, like electricity to serve our plants and field facilities, those have been increasing, uh, as well as chemical costs used to treat our wastewater. So we've incorporated those increases into the 2020 budget. We're also adding four uh, sewer maintenance workers to improve maintenance services out in our sewer collection system. Uh, that sewer collection system is about 4,500 miles long when you add it all up. Like water, the budget includes debt service expenses, which make up 59% of the division's total budget, which pays back the principal and interest on bonds and loans, again, like water, to support our capital program. Our capital program is driven largely by EPA regulatory requirements, as you're aware. In 2020, our Blueprint Columbus will, program will continue in neighborhoods to eliminate the source of sewer overflows and basement backups. Finally, our division of power, the budget there is about 94 million, which is 8.6% higher than 2019. The large increase is due to our purchase power costs, um, as well as some additional personnel. 60% of the power's budget, or 58 million, supports the wholesale purchase of electric power to support our customers. These rates were locked in about five years ago based on market conditions at the time. Personnel costs for the Division of Power are increasing about 10% to support the expansion of additional field crews to maintain existing customers and hook up new residential and commercial customers. In 2020, we plan to hire six power line cable worker trainee positions to support these crews. Finally, in 2020, we'll continue our neighborhood street lighting program with several projects planned to promote vehicle and pedestrian safety and continue to invest in maintenance and expansion of our electric distribution network. President Pro Tem Brown, thank you for the opportunity to summarize the Department of Public Utilities 2020 budget. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Assistant Director Lee. Um, and 
My colleague, Council Member Rob Dorrance, who chairs the Utilities Committee, is holding a hearing, I believe, tomorrow in Chambers about potential rate increases, correct? That is correct. And your budget is based off of, uh, obviously, a, what we hope is a successful outcome to keep the solvency of the department? Correct. Great. Great. Thank you. And then your public hearing for utilities is um, on, why is it so hard to read this list? is on Thursday, December 12th at 5 p.m., right here in this room, along with technology and neighborhoods. So thank you, Assistant Director Lee. Um, next, we have the Department of Development, Director Mike Stevens. Thank you, Chair Brown, for the opportunity to present the Department of Development portion of the 2020 operating budget. The Department of Development is proposing a total operating budget of $54 million strategically focused on affordable housing, neighborhoods, and job creation. This includes $30 million from the general fund, $19 million in federal fund grants, and $5 million from department funds. $26 million, or 48 percent, will be used to address our community's affordable housing needs. These funds are designed to increase home ownership, provide gap financing to construct new housing stock, and provide affordable rental housing. $21 million, or 39 percent of our budget, will be used to provide services to our neighborhoods and residents. These services include social service grants, proactive code enforcement, and much needed infrastructure projects. Seven million or 13 percent will go to supporting the growth of new jobs, private investment, and entrepreneur initiatives. Next, I'd like to speak specifically about the general fund. The general fund represents 55 percent of the department's overall resources. The request for 2020 is approximately 30 million. This is an overall increase of two million dollars over 2019, and the additional funds would be used to establish a second proactive code enforcement team our proactive code enforcement teams are instrumental in assessing code violations before a complaint is submitted. This initiative has been successful in part of our and it has been a successful part of our code enforcement program by proactively working to keep our neighborhoods safe. Secondly, we are proposing the transfer of 22 employees that were previously funded by the federal or department funds to the general fund. This allows us to reallocate the federal funds to neighborhood infrastructure projects. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Director Stevens. Um, the, the PACE program, can you, uh, can you detail sort of how they choose priorities and if it's neighborhood-based or um, uh, more sort of responsiveness-based, just, you know, where, where you see the hot spots? Kind of detail how the team actually works to get at the root of the problem. So we have a... Um, set up a, a series of criteria to help rank out which one of those, um, a lot of it's uh, apartment complexes that need attention. Based, some of it's based on the number of three, or based on 311 calls. So it's not, the, it, one resident can't call 75 times and that has that property put on the list. It's, we, but we look at the number of 311 calls we receive and, and the, also we work with the city attorney's office to identify uh, sites that might be uh, needing a, more attention. Um, thank you. Uh, next, we have Director of the Department of Human Resources, Nicole Brandon. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Pro Tem Brown. Thank you for the opportunity to provide an overview of Mayor Ginther's 2020 General Fund and Employee Benefits Fund budget for the Department of Human Resources. The 2020 General Fund budget is $3,122,816. And this reflects a 4.4% increase over the 2019 general fund budget. The employee benefits fund is budgeted at 5,808,000 and this reflects a 16% increase over the 2019 budget. This additional funding will allow the department to add two full-time positions, one in the employee resources section and one in the employee benefits and wellness section. These additional positions will enhance the service delivery we are able to provide to city employees. The additional funds will also allow our office to increase the employee benefits consultant contract due to a broader and more inclusive level of responsibility. This will also allow us to absorb the cost of both medical and pharmacy audits as pre, post, and periodic contract audits are considered an industry best practice. The vendor will reimburse the fund for the cost of the audits but additional or initial funding is necessary in order to set up the contracts. 
We will also be in a position to increase training and development, continue funding for the workers' compensation fraud investigations, and purchase necessary occupational safety supplies. Thank you for your continued support of the Department of Human Resources. I would also like to thank Mayor Ginther and the Department of Finance for their support and guidance through this process. This concludes my presentation. I, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Brandon. Are there are any of our uh, contracts set to expire? Uh, does negotiating begin on any of our collective bargaining agreements this year? Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, all of our uh, all of our contracts with our labor unions expire in 2020. So we will begin negotiations with AFSME, uh, Local 1632 first, as their contract expires in March of 2020. So we will begin those negotiations um, by January. And so for budgeting purposes, you operate off of a loose set of assumptions about what you think the cost implications of, uh, you know, the next collective bargaining agreement may be. Um, is there difficulty budgeting for a year? I mean, that's my assumption. Is there difficulty budgeting for a year when all these contracts are open? And um, how does the department handle that? Well, we have to work directly with the Department of Finance when it comes to that. Obviously, our budget doesn't necessarily support the changes or increases that uh, were negotiated in the contracts. That would be uh, some really close coordination with the Department of Finance. What we do have to budget for is the uh, contract that we have with uh, the law firm that assists us during negotiations. So when we are in a year where we have all six bargaining contracts expiring, we will have obviously more uh, negotiations and more time at the table with that consultant. And so we take into consideration whether or not we need to make adjustments to that contract. But any increases that result from negotiating the contracts, meaning you know, wages or anything like that, we have to work with finance to determine the impact, and we do work very closely with them for that. Thank you, Dr. Brandon. You're welcome. Um, next, we have um, Director Paul Rakoski of Recreation and Parks Department. Director. Thank you, President Pro Tem Brown and Chair Brown. Uh, the Columbus Recreation and Parks uh, mission is to connect the people of our community through the power of nature, wellness, and creativity. We do that through more than 380 parks, 29 community centers, five athletic complexes, six golf courses, 120 miles of regional trails, one indoor year-round swim center, eight outdoor pools, three splash pads, three splash grounds, and two interactive fountains. And we do all of this to ensure that every resident of our community has access to all of our many services. In support of that vision and mission, our budget for 2020 uh, is $55.8 million. That budget is comprised with several components. 39.9 million of that is a general fund transfer uh, into the Recreation and Parks Operating Fund, 550,000 through encumbrance cancellations. We have fleet and internal services that are about two million that are added into our budget from finance and earned revenue of 12.2 million uh, of our own earned revenue. And then we were lucky enough uh, for the first time that I've been able to help present the budget here at Rec and Parks to say that it's beyond a continuation budget. And we do have 1.2 million that the mayor's office and finance was gracious enough to add to our budget for some very important expansions that I'll touch briefly on. Uh, the recre th that budget total of 55.8 represents about a 2.8% increase over our projected uh, 2019 expenditures. The revenue figure, the earned revenue figure of 12.2 represents about a 1.5% increase from our projected revenues in the current year. As you know, several years ago, we went through a cost allocation uh, exercise within the department made across the board changes in regard to our fees that we charge for our permits and uh, programs. Uh, that resulted in larger increases of revenue during those first couple of years of implementing those new charges. The one and a half percent that we see going into next year for our own earned revenue is probably more in line with what it's gonna be year to year until all of that would be revisited again. But as you know, we try to keep our programs uh, very accessible for the residents of Columbus and the folks who visit our city, so we don't ever want to raise those too, too much. 
One of the other things that you'll see is that our full-time count has gone up more than it has in the past from 345 to 356 full-time employees. I will say that four of those increases have little to no impact on the budget. Uh, they were internal changes with folks that were either already working many hours part-time with insurance or they were part-time to full-time conversions that we've done. We had two target adjustments within that that were granted by finance and then five expansion pos uh, positions that uh, I'll speak to you again briefly uh, in a minute for a total of 11 new uh, positions in the budget. Uh, some highlights of just our, our, our base budget is that we're very excited that next year the Linden Community Center, our first center for opportunity, uh, is going to be opening uh, next year. So we're budgeted accordingly for that and have been working very hard on uh, working with partners to establish programming for that, that new uh, center. It'll be a 55,000 square foot center that we're very ex uh, excited about opening up and, and operating. Uh, APPS programming is funded at almost $1.9 million in uh, 2020. Uh, we have, uh, we're part of the neighborhood safety strategy, as you know, and that's fully funded our, our aspect of that in the budget. Uh, the food program, the summer food program that's so important uh, for our department is completely supported and fully supported in the budget. Uh, we're looking to serve approximately 500,000 meals is what we're trying to, to hit as our goal for 2020. We also have the summer work program that's so important to the youth here in Columbus and to a lot of our departments that, that, that use those uh, and, and hire and employ those, those youth. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, we're beginning our urban forestry master plan process. We have about 2.6 million budgeted for our forestry uh, division. We also have partners that we, uh, we work with out there and the, the, the subsidies that we uh, supply to those uh, uh, partners for operation purposes are fully funded. Franklin Park Conservatory, 350,000. King Arts, 125,000. And then we also support uh, CO AAA uh, with a small subsidy of 182, a little over 182 thousand uh, dollars, 3.8 million allocated to golf and 1.3 million allocated to aquatics. We were lucky, as I mentioned earlier, and we're very grateful to have received a couple of expansions. As you know, we've entered into a security audit of the department. We started with phase one of that, which included our uh, 29 community centers. We received $100,000 to begin and, and, and also be able to go into phase two, which will include our shelters and some of our uh, additional parks and other uh, uh, spaces within the, the department's portfolio. We are increasing uh, by one full-time position uh, in our food program. Uh, Julie Pruitt, who currently runs that program, is stepping back in her responsibilities and focusing more on data. So we'll be bringing in someone to head up that program in conjunction with the health department. Uh, we have another uh, position added to deal with, uh, you know, gun violence, part of our comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy. Uh, Director Lombardi mentioned the Southeast Recreation Initiative, a second uh, rec center without walls, a little over 178,000 for that some support for our special events, our internal special events to ensure that we can continue to offer quality programming uh, to, the, to our visitors and, and, the, and the citizens of Columbus, residents of Columbus. And then Dorian Green has been under a maintenance contract, an extended maintenance contract, our new park over by COSI that is, expires here at the end of the year. So we have two full-time gardeners coming on to take care of that very beautiful, but it, fairly labor-intensive park. So those all total 1.2 million. Again, we're gracious to have had those added to our budget and for the overall support that we get from the mayor, finance department, and council and yourself. So that uh, concludes my testimony. I know we'll be talking again shortly in December. Yes, we will. Um, thank you so much, Director Rakoski. And um, we have our hearing on December 11th. Next, um, we will go to the Department of Building and Zoning Services, Cheryl Trustell. Thank you, Chair Brown. 
The 2020 budget for the Department of Building and Zoning Services totals just over $25 million and provides for 164 full-time employees and 17 part-time employees. The department is organized into four distinct yet interconnected sections, building, zoning, site engineering, and customer services are the service areas that combine to ensure safe, quality development in the city. All activities of the department are funded exclusively through permit and licensing revenues. These revenues are based upon the fee schedule that was effective January of 2019. No general fund dollars are used to support the department. The 2020 budget will allow us to continue to streamline processes for our customers with more online access, expansion of electronic plans review, and improving the zoning process. It also includes $290,000 for the replacement of 10 vehicles. Thank you for the, your consideration of our budget. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have the Assistant Director of the Department of Education, Mr. Matt Smido. President Pro Tem Brown, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you the proposed 2020 budget for the Department of Education. Uh, our total proposed budget is $6.7 million. The majority of this funding, uh, $4.7 million, is for Early Start Columbus. The Early Start Columbus Initiative, our pre-K expansion program, provides direct support for our pre-K slots, child development associate certificates, professional service contracts, and consultants fees. Uh, through this program, we have provided a high-quality pre-K education to over 45,000, I'm sorry, I wish, 4,500 Columbus children over the last six years. And because of the importance of making data-driven decisions, we're requesting about 130,000 for technical support for the Seahive platform, and 268,000 for Ready for Success which is our assessment and teacher coaching program. Providing a safe environment for children to learn after the school day ends remains a priority for our department. The department requests continuation level funds of 389,000 to continue to provide mini grants to after school providers to assist them in their work. In addition, 542,000 will support the administration of our department. Chair Brown, we deeply appreciate the support that you and all of council have given us over the last six years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your call out for the Seahive program. And if you could just peel back the onion one layer for us and explain what that means to make data-driven data -driven decisions. Certainly. Um, util util utilizing Seahive. Uh, President Pro Tem Brown, thank you. Uh, this is um, our, our data platform that, that all of our providers utilize. Uh, they put information on uh, all their children into the system, including the pre and post tests that we receive through Ready for Success. So it uh, allows us and our providers to determine the needs of the children you know, as they occur. So we can see if a child is failing in a certain area and this, this data will help our providers make adjustments in those curriculum throughout the year. Thank you so much, um, Assistant Director Smido. Um, next up is Department of Neighborhoods. We have Director Carlo Williams Scott. Good afternoon. President Pro Tim Brown, um, and thank you for the opportunity to present the department's 2020 operating budget. The Department of Neighborhoods serves as the front door to city and government services for our residents. In 2019, the 47 members of my team worked to maximize our $5.3 million budget to deliver on Mayor Ginther's commitment to our neighborhoods and help build a stronger and more equitable community. We are excited for the future and I'm pleased to share the highlights of our 2020 budget with you. Our 2020 budget of just over $6 million will include 48 full-time and two part-time employees. We will expand the team with two new, two new customer service representatives in our 311 Customer Service Center. With over 430,000 customer contacts per year, these new staff will be a tremendous asset and ensure that we continue to provide excellent customer service to every resident. A new Office Assistant 3 will join our team. They will provide administrative support and serve as our receptionist when we move to the 1410 Cleveland Avenue facility later in 2020. Funding will also con continue for our neighborhood and community planning efforts. This was added in 2019 to address concerns that include housing, education, workforce, safety, and health in each of our opportunity neighborhoods. Advancing the Linden and Hilltop plans is a priority in 2020. This funding, and this funding includes implementation of projects identified by the community and to, 
to um, conduct community re remediation services. The Neighborhood Crisis Response Program, part of the Comprehensive Neighborhood Sa Safety Strategy, is building momentum. Informed by, neighborhoods, by information provided by our neighborhood safety committees and community data, investments will be made in the social determinants of safety through dedicated funding and cross-agency partners, cross partnerships. We will continue to support our new and growing new American community in Columbus. This work will include providing translation and interpretation services and offering the New American Leadership Academy. With nearly 60 graduates of the New American Leadership Academy, we will continue to provide this uh, leadership development and training to increase civic engagement from our newest residents. Our third cohort is currently underway and includes individuals from 14 different, representing 14 different nationalities. In 2020, we will welcome a new group with an extended and more in-depth learning experience. The important work to reduce the disparities facing boys and young men of color will continue through the My Brother's Keeper program. We are excited about the creation of a statewide MBK network to accelerate this work in partnership with the Obama Foundation and MBK Ohio. In 2020, our efforts in Columbus will focus on implementing a new framework that will help to provide pathways of opportunity for boys and young men of color. Since we became a department, we have worked with community leaders and added three new area commissions. In 2020, we will continue our support of all 21 area commissions. This will include an, an annual allocation to each group, as well as enhanced training identified through our outreach efforts, technical assistance, and other efforts to build awareness and capacity of our area commissions. Finally, in 2020, the Columbus Neighborhood and Community Grants, we will continue the Community Neighborhood Grants and our annual Martin Luther King and Black History Month programs. Last but certainly not least, I would like to thank the members of my team, Todd Diefenderfer and Julia Carter, our analysts from the Department of Finance and Management, Mayor Ginther, and the Mayor's Office for providing guidance through this budget process. This concludes my presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, um, Director William Scott. And you mentioned the number of new area commissions. That's tremendous. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of work for your team and for you to do that. <clears throat> Obviously, means a great deal to our residents to be able to organize in that fashion. So thank you um, for that hard work this year. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, wonderful. We will, we will move on to the Department of Technology. Fiscal Manager Susanna Gussler or Goosler? Gussler. Gussler, great. Uh, good afternoon, President Pro Tem Brown. And thank you for the opportunity to present the Department of Technology's proposed 2020 budget. Can you hear me okay? This microphone is kind of high. The Department of Technology, or DOT, provides many essential services in support of local government. It is through provision of these services, which includes applications and programming, security, desktop and help desk support, GIS, data management, media services, and network infrastructure maintenance that we support both our internal and external customers. At $43,866,268, the department's 2020 operating budget provides sufficient funding to continue to offer these services at current levels. As an internal service agency, DOT bills its customers for services on a monthly basis. Both general fund and other fund agencies are billed. In 2020, of the $43.86 million, $7,995,692 is budgeted on behalf of our customer ag agencies in a so-called direct service budget. These funds are used to procure, procure technology goods and services on behalf of our customers and are billed back on a one-for-one -one basis. The balance of $35,870,576 will be used to fund the technology department's daily operations and our build back on a cost allocation basis. Approximately 47% or 20.6 million will be billed to general fund agencies while the balance of 53% or 23.2 million will be billed to other fund agencies. The budget funds 160 full-time and seven part-time employees in its two division. 
The director's office budget funds 15 full-time and three part-time employees, while the information services budget funds 146 full-time and four part-time employees. Of these totals, one full-time and one part-time employee were funded um, as expansion proposed as expansions um, in the CTV section to address increased workloads in that area. Not reflected in the $43.8 million figure, but worth noting are plans to make available $700,000 for replacement of computers and general fund agencies. These monies have in the past come from the Special Income Tax Fund or General Permanent Improvement Fund. Finally, the 2020 budget includes $681,516 for the 27th pay period. I think other people here have noted that. Um, examples of high priority projects that will be funded at least in part by the 2020 operating budget include the geographic information system project will continue into 2020. This project involves several city agencies including building and zoning, public utilities and public service. The upgrade of the voice over internet protocol or VoIP system will continue as, as will the collaboration with Columbus Public Schools and the upgrade of their uh, VoIP system. The department will continue to work with the Public Safety Department on its infrastructure modernization projects and work will also continue on upgrade of the city's IT infrastructure with the data center upgrades and implementation of a new infrastructure platform also known as hyperconvergence. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the budget and that concludes my remarks and if there are any questions Great. I will attempt to answer them. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate uh, your time today and being here. And um, yes, I think folks have mentioned the 27th pay period. Um, since I was not here in 2008, this was the first time, which is when the last time we, we had a 20, 27 pay period, this is the first time I'd encountered that. It's an interesting thing. Um, and uh, Director Lombardi, that comes from the citywide transfer line um, where we've been sort of saving resources over the last 11 years, anticipating that this would happen again. Is that right? That's correct. That's uh, every year um, since 08, we've been putting uh, approximately $1.2, $1 million every budget cycle to build that up. And we'll continue to do that after the 2020 budget. I believe it's paid out in December. I think the total will be like 27 million. And I think the total payout is estimated at about like 26 million. So. Great. Thank you. Um, next, we have the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, our Chief Diversity Officer, Demita Brown. Thank you, Council President Pro Tem, for the opportunity to present our budget this afternoon. And also like to say thank you to Mayor Genther and D Director Lombardi and his team of special note, Heather Trainer, uh, for their assistance in helping us get to this point um, and the budget all allocation that we have today that continues to elevate the value of diversity and inclusion across the city's core operations and the services delivered to our residents. The 2020 budget for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion marks what I would regard as a transformative year for the office, the plans of which touch on several strategic priorities of the mayor as well as council to advance economic inclusion throughout our supply chain, working with diverse suppliers as well as through our workforce pipeline with a special focus on the impact of our work to Columbus residents and job seekers. The 2020 budget builds on gains and commitments of council and the administration already in place uh, to advance the strategic priorities around the implementation of the disparity study, the procurement of a diversity management software system, and demonstration of continued leadership throughout the region in the area of, div of diversity and inclusion. Of special note, in the 2020 budget is also the expansion of staff to continue to deliver on the mayor's priorities related to diversity and inclusion. Some of the highlights of the budget include, uh, as I mentioned, the disparity study impl implementation, where we will work with the consultant uh, to establish a cross-functional team of internal and external stakeholders to establish the priorities within the recommendations provided by the consultant the efficacy of the recommendations and the best approaches to the implementation. Additionally, the team will employ a number of engagement strategies to promote enhanced levels of input from our minority and women-owned business community stakeholders uh, to include online survey tools and focus group discussions. 
as I mentioned earlier, the diversity management system will also be a key priority for our office going into 2020. And it will enable us to uh, more strategically align our procurement practices to sound forward-thinking policy around economic inclusion. The system not only helps the office to move away from an unstable program that is also requires a lot of manual entry, but also allows us the opportunity to be much more accountable and responsive to our internal and external stakeholders with respect to our inclusion efforts. Additionally, we have continued an aggressive outreach and engagement strategy for both diverse talent as well as our diverse businesses to enhance diversity with, within both our employment and our supply chain. Having made concerted efforts to meet with individuals and groups from our priority neighborhoods, that will continue to be a major focus. Beginning in 2020, we're also beginning to lay the groundwork for what we are describing as leadership uh, in the area of diversity and inclusion. In next year's budget, um, activities will be very much focused on uh, diversity and education training around diversity and inclusion, partnerships with a number of diverse organizations and programs, including Central State and Wilberforce Universities. And lastly, we will culminate our leadership in this area around a biannual diversity and inclusion leadership symposium, which is our, which the planning of which is already underway, again, to promote our, the importance of diversity and inclusion and our commitment to diversity and inclusion for both our residents as well as our business owners moving forward. Um, last but not least, the budget also includes the expansion of staff to promote uh, diversity and inclusion, which will include a compliance officer, the addition of a business development specialist who will continue to work with our business owners, um, as well as a data analyst who will help us to better manage the data. As we move into 2020, data will be very much a focus for us so that we can begin to understand where those key opportunities are for diversity and inclusion and how we best utilize our resources to achieve parity. That includes my presentation today. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, thank you so much. 2020 is going to be a very busy year for you. Um, and it's and the work that you are leading, um, and I know that the, the mayor is supporting along with you, is some of the most important work the city's gonna do in 2020. Um, so thank you very much. Um, for your efforts Thank and you. for um, you know getting us to this point to plan for such a big year in 2020. Truly appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, the um, Columbus Public Health um, Health Commissioner, Dr. Mashika Roberts. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, President Pro Tem Brown and other members of council. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight Columbus Public Health's proposed 2020 Health Special Revenue Fund budget of $35 million. $842,437. As you know, Columbus Public Health played a critical role in protecting the health and improving the lives of all of our residents in 2019. Despite our best efforts, our community continues to be challenged by the opiate epidemic, a lower but still high number of gun violence deaths, high infant mortality rates, and health disparities created by the social determinants of health. These critical issues will continue to impact the community, the health of all of our residents and our work in 2020. We are excited about new opportunities to improve health thanks to this proposed budget. The purchase of a mobile medical unit in the amount of $165,000 will provide evidence-based high quality care and services to people who need them the most where they are. Because of this flexibility, the mobile unit will reach those individuals who are disconnected from care or unable to travel to the conventional brick and mortar clinics for health services. Mobile medical units are also versatile in service options and delivery. It will be utilized for regular healthcare services in community locations such as drug treatment facilities, homeless shelters, and courthouses, or quickly mobilized to ground zero with Narcan and fentanyl test strips during emergency drug overdose surges. The Columbus Care Coalition, a collaborative effort led by the Columbus Public Health to address community trauma and build resilience as part of a comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy, continues to be funded at $1,080,450. Another element of the comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy is the Violent Crime Review Group, 
a multi-department committee working to understand and lower homicides in three target neighborhoods. The Violent Crime Review Group is funded $129,000 to provide a social worker at Columbus Public Health, as well as an interventionist at Recreation and Parks for an innovative pilot program at Grant Medical Center that will provide victims of violent crime who enroll in the program with comprehensive services to reduce rearrest and injury recidivism. Likewise, funding of $1,482,074 is provided to address heroin and opiate use as a part of the Columbus and Franklin County Addiction Plan. A total of $350,000 of this funding will continue to support the Safe Point program at Equitas Health, providing naloxone access, addiction counseling, treatment referrals, infectious disease screenings, linkage to care, and prevention education. Additionally, $50,000 is specifically provided for medication-assisted treatment services through our contract with OSU Hospital Talbot Hall right at Columbus Public Health. As we continue our collective work to reduce infant mortality, an increase in the amount of $267,000 will expand Columbus Public Health's pre- and postnatal evidence-based home visiting services by serving an additional 75 to 100 women and families annually. In 2019, as you know, Columbus Public Health began implementing the Healthy Families America evidence-based home visiting model in conjunction with maintaining comprehensive teams of nurses, social workers, and outreach workers in order to provide holistic services. These additional funds will allow for us to add four outreach workers and one licensed social worker to our teams to provide perinatal home visiting services for more women and babies in order to help reduce infant deaths. And while working together with all of you to address these pressing public health issues, we also continue to provide some basic public health services that our residents depend on to live healthier and safer lives. For example, in 2019, we provided 30,000 immunizations, 10,000 patient visits in our STD clinic, we responded to over 40 outbreaks and over 10,000 disease investigations, provided over 5,500 home visits, trained 855 safe sleep ambassadors, conducted more than 16,000 food inspections, and provided nearly 106,000 birth and death certificates. The proposed 2020 budget allows continued provision of these public health services that are mandated as well as priority programs that the Board of Health deems minimally essential to meet Ohio's public health standards. We will address our community's priority areas while, continue our basic, by, while continuing our basic services and programs that protect the health and improve the lives of our residents. In closing, I just want to assure you all that your investment means quality public health care and protection are, will be available to all of your residents. We will continue to operate with high efficiency and effectiveness to serve the health and safety needs of our entire community. As always, we really appreciate your support and the guidance of Columbus City Council through this process, as well as all year long. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts. Um, I appreciate that outline of the uh, just incredibly important community work done by public health all year. Thank you. Um, and then finally, our final uh, department or cabinet presentation is from the Executive Director of the Civil Service Commission, Amy Geelong. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Brown. As you know, the Civil Service Commission is part of the checks and balances of city government and is responsible for maintaining a merit system of employment to ensure that city employment is accessible and filled with qualified and competent individuals. To that end, the Commission's budget request for 2020 is $4,427,504. This reflects a 2% decrease from our final 2019 appropriation of $4,521,712. This decrease is a result of us not administering the firefighter test, which we administer every other year. Um, some of our other major Expenditures for 2020 is our uniform testing staff, which is 654,300. Our uniform testing staff and expenditures, which is 1,205,500. Our 
our applicant and employee services area, which is $809,100, and administration and other expenses, which is, includes our um, $200,000 grant for Restoration Academy, which is $1,740,000. With this adoption of the request of our budget, the commission will have a total of 36 full-time and 12 part-time regular positions to carry out our classification and application assessment and testing responsibilities. And with that, I'd like to thank you and be happy to entertain any questions you might have concerning our request. Great, thank you so much. Um, see, we have no further resident um, speaker slips that have um, been registered with us. So um, that means that with your testimony, Executive Director DeLong, we have we've completed department presentations. So thank you very much for everyone's time. Um, I do want to make sure I'm just spreading the word about our upcoming individual committee hearings um, because they're going to come at us fast after Thanksgiving. We have two on December 3rd, one at 3.30 and one at 5. Health and Human Services at 3.30, Economic Development, Environment and Administration at 5. Then on Tuesday, December 10th, we've got Public Service, Housing and uh, Judiciary at 4.30 p.m at Driving Park Community Center. Um, Wednesday the 11th at 10 a.m. we have Finance, Education, and Recreation and Parks. Wednesday the 11th at 4 p.m. we have Public Safety and Veterans and Seniors Affairs. Uh, Thursday, December 12th at 5 p.m. we have Neighborhoods, Technology, and Public Utilities. And Tuesday, December tw uh, 17th at 5.30 we have Small and Minority Business Committee. Um, so thank you all again. Um, I also want to thank Matt Erickson. Um, who runs our policy office at the city of at, at council for the city of Columbus and um, without whom we would not be able to um, put together the council side of budget deliberations. So thank you. Um, and also to my um, office staff, Kelsey Ellingson and uh, James Carmine, thank you as well. And with that, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for your time here, um, everyone. <laughs>